our fourth session on Israel, uh, God's Chosen. Is that the title? We don't have PowerPoint. That's why we don't use PowerPoint. Thank you, my love. Um, so a lot going on in Israel. Anybody heard? <laughs> There's always a lot going on in Israel. Well, they're getting a lot of pressure to stop uh, in Gaza, aren't they? Yeah. And they got some hostages that they're hoping to get released. Uh, we'll see what happens in the coming days, but we continue to keep Israel in our prayers. And I want to uh, put something in front of you. Uh, so someone forwarded to me, they have, they have Jewish friends who are not Christians uh, from Israel. They have family friends back home in Israel. And one thing that was uh, mentioned, uh, they shared an email with me from these people in Israel is, hey, we hear that there are actually a lot of Christians who support Israel and uh, love Israel, uh, Israelis. Is there any way that you could make videos of people maybe giving support of, uh, of, the, of the, the Jewish people and could be shared with us? And so one thought that we had was um, in the next couple of weeks, what we might like to do is maybe, I think Annie might be the one to get to do this because she, she's really good with video, is she could walk around to a few people who'd be willing to just very candidly, whether you're sitting in the chairs or you're back there talking with coffee, give a, uh, an encouraging message to the Jewish people uh, and just share something of your support, of your love, of your prayers for them. And then we could sort of create that into one video and send it. And it would really bless Jewish people in Israel right now and perhaps even begin to turn the key to unlock op and open doors uh, to faith in Jesus Christ. Gary. I'm not aware of it, but I'm su not surprised either. He said that, this, I heard that he said, to all Jews everywhere, do not travel, if you do not have to. Take your phone with you, have it at this particular embassy, the Israeli embassy, on speed dial, watch yourself. Yep. Carefully. He said, I can't believe I'm saying this, but that will happen. Yep. Yes, it's, it, it, it's this weird um, tension in the, in the age in which we live, biblically speaking, uh, and in light of the revelation of Scripture, that on the one hand, this is what is happening. Israel will constantly live under threat of extinction. That, that's the way, it, it's actually God's doing at this point. It's, it's they're being set aside by God. And it's also, at the same time, God's doing that they continue to be preserved because of the purposes that he has for them in the future. And so it's this weird thing where, on the one hand, we pray for Israel, we pray for Jerusalem, we pray for the Jewish people, we, we hope for and pray for their salvation and their repentance and all of that. The culmination and the climax and the fulfillment of all of those prayers will come, actually, at the coming of Jesus Christ. And so it's actually um, our prayers, you could say, are in some way an expression of our faith and what the canon of Scripture has told us about the destiny of the Jewish people that God has planned. And we're going to look at that some more today. Um, we're in the New Covenant. We have, we, we began with the Abrahamic Covenant. Uh, we began uh, there where the promise of a nation was given before that nation even existed. The nation came into existence and then God entered into a covenant with that nation at Mount Sinai called the Mosaic Covenant. And in the Mosaic Covenant, God covenanted with the nation of Israel, the de physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are terms to that covenant uh, that would allow them to stay in the land with blessings or, be, or suffer uh, the curse of God and be taken off the land. And so the Mosaic Covenant came into history, came into existence, and then now we are studying the New Covenant. And the New Covenant, actually, is uh, the covenant at, by which all of us here today have a relationship with God. We do not have a relationship with God through the Mosaic Covenant, 
every single one of us here who know the Lord Jesus Christ, who have believed on him for salvation, are participants in the new covenant, okay? That's the basis of our relationship with God, is the new covenant. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at, we began last week to look at what the new covenant is, that God introduced it in the book of Jeremiah, right before, a couple hundred years prior to the exile. You remember the history of Israel? Is they're in the land, they're living there, they're rebelling against God. God is warning them that if they don't repent, if they don't turn, then he is going to take them off the land. And before he actually took them off the land, prophets were coming and prophets were coming and warning and warning. And one of those prophets, Jeremiah, God said through the prophet Jeremiah that, that because they continue to break my covenant, the Mosaic covenant, I'm going to form a new covenant with them. Because the Mosaic covenant just can't get the job done, so to speak, as far as God having some sort of ongoing, fruitful relationship with the nation of Israel. They need a new covenant, some sort of new arrangement so that I can tolerate them, you know? So we'll, we're going to go through and we're going to see that. But I want us to understand from the scripture, not from me standing here and speaking it to you. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews. We're going to go to the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to go to Galatians. We're going to go to Romans. The New Testament is the commentary explaining the new covenant to us in contrast with the Mosaic covenant. And why we are not under the Mosaic covenant. Why we are not in any way obligated to the Mosaic covenant. And why the Mosaic Covenant does nothing for us today, because everything has been done through the New Covenant in the person of Jesus Christ. The New Covenant is what we need to hold up, we need to focus on, and we need to see that this is the basis of our relationship. Okay, uh, so let me pray. Um, pause. Before I pray, yeah, I'm going to pray, and then I want to give you an illustration that I think might be helpful to tie those three covenants together for us, okay? Okay. So let's pray, and then I'm going to do that, and then we're going to get into our uh, beautiful marker boards. Father, we thank you this morning that by the blood of Jesus Christ and not the blood of animals like bulls and goats and lambs do we have entrance into your presence. But we approach you with boldness and with confidence, Hebrews says, because of Jesus Christ. It is not through our sweat religiously or morally or our devotion to spiritual or religious things, but God, it is the finished and accomplished work of Jesus Christ. We remember what Hebrews declares, that after he made purification for sins, he sat down at your right hand, our Lord and Savior, alive from the dead, ascended in glory to your right hand, returning to you after you sent him into this world. He sits, that seat of accomplishment, God. And so we know today that our sins are finished because his work is finished. And God, he has done that and taken them away from us. So God, we come before you today with great confidence and boldness. We gather together with that boldness and confidence. And we pray, Father, that as we study uh, these covenants, as we look with an eye towards the nation of Israel, and Lord, how they are special to you, not only in the past, but even now and into the future, God, would you open our eyes to see, uh, Lord, how all of Scripture connects and comes together and to see your purposes as they unfold and as they will continue to unfold in the days and the months and the years ahead. We pray these things, God. Illuminate our minds, we pray, through the light of your word and the work of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, an illustration. So a triathlon. A triathlon has how many uh, phases to it? Three. What are those phases? Swimming. There, we've got a swimmer. Biking. I thought you said hiking. I was like, that's a new one. Biking. And what's the third one? Running. Running, okay. So each one of those phases are a phase of one grand event. And the biking phase, what do you use when you're in the biking phase? A bicycle. But if you want to swim and you want to run, when you come into those phases and the biking phase is over, and I think the, that's the second one, right? And then you, the bike's the second one and then the third one is running, okay? Once you get off that bike, the bike no longer serves a purpose for the next phase that you are in. It's set aside. Because now the phase that you're in requires that you run. It requires, it's, it's a different phase. And what you used in the prior phase has no application in the new phase. I'm sure you can start to connect where I'm going with this. The Mosaic Covenant is like a bicycle. Okay, everybody, every time you ride a bike now, next year you're going to be like, the Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant. <laughs> you know? 
But the Mosaic Covenant served a purpose for a phase in history. Now that, the Mosaic, now that we are in a new phase, the phase of the new covenant, the bicycle of the Mosaic Covenant is set aside. It has no application in this new phase that we are in. We are now under the new covenant because Christ has come and established that in his blood. Okay? I hope that illustration helps to maybe illuminate just a little bit more, make an analogy a little bit more, that, that sometimes when people want to carry forward the Mosaic Covenant into the Christian life, it is an incorrect, unbiblical thing to do because it, in a sense, says that what Christ has done, he has not done. It's treating the work of Christ as though somehow he has not done it or it was insufficient or somehow like he hasn't come and done that. It's the fulfillment. So we're gonna, here's what we're going to see. We're going to start to walk through why a new covenant was necessary. Why the Mosaic Covenant is not the termination of God's plans in human history. Why God had things beyond the Mosaic Covenant planned. This is a list of the things. I got them written up here already, so you can already start to read them, but we're going to go through these verses so you can see it for yourself. What we have here is we have these are the things that the new covenant does that the Mosaic covenant cannot do. It could not do, and it was never designed to do. Only these things are accomplished through the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. Not the blood of bulls and goats, not the Levitical priesthood, nothing like that. In the book of Galatians, so if you will, turn with me to the book of Galatians. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 3. Okay, Galatians chapter 3. Paul says, you foolish Galatians, verse 1. Boy, I would not want a letter to our church from an apostle to start out that way. <laughs> Who has bewitched you? Right before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit of God by works of the law or by believing what you heard? That's a rhetorical question. The answer to that question is what? Believing. Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Let me explain what he means there. Number one, you did not receive the Holy Spirit, referring to their salvation, by works of the law. You received the Spirit of God when you realized the works of the law were insufficient to save your soul, and so you believed on the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified, who was clearly, that message was clearly portrayed to you. And when you believe that message, you receive the Holy Spirit. But then in the very next sentence, he goes on to the sanctification process of the Christian life. When he says, are you so foolish? After beginning in your salvation by means of the Spirit, are you now in your Christian life trying to finish and perfect yourself in the Christian faith by means of the flesh? Which is a reference to following the law. He is all over them about trying to resuscitate, right, the Mosaic Law. Let's get that baby alive and running, you know? Give it some CPR, bring it back to life. Let's live by the Mosaic. Let's live by something that God has set aside as dead. It's not working anymore. Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Faith contrasted with the works of the law. You're seeing this contrast all throughout here. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now we're going to watch. I'm going to read right down to, and verse 14 is going to be the one where I'm going to bring out this diagram right here, okay? Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced in the gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. When God told Abraham, all people will be blessed through you, what he did not detail out for Abraham, but what he intended to detail out later throughout history and explain in more detail is that, that Abraham, through his seed, Jesus Christ, 
Abraham would bless all nations through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was not exactly and explicitly explained to Abraham. But the message, all nations will be blessed through you, it was a general statement that contained the specific details of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? So watch what he says. Verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, curses everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Let me ask you a question. Is the Mosaic law looking promising for eternal life? No. Clearly no one who relies on the law, verse 11, is justified before God because, quote, the righteous will live by faith, unquote. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Works. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole or a tree or the cross. Okay? In other words, Jesus Christ, when he hung on the cross, it's not just a necklace. That is the place of God's curse. The curse that is the result of sin. And the curse that belongs on us, instead he was our substitute and it fell on him and he experienced our curse on the cross. Okay? And so what he's saying is, he's saying, he's saying the law, the only thing the law can do is condemn you. Which is why he begins the chapter with, why are you now trying to follow the law? It is not a method by which you walk in the new life. It is not even the thing that can give you new life. He's saying, leave the law alone. And when we get into Hebrews in a moment, you're going to see this is the resounding gong throughout the whole New Testament. Okay? This is huge. Um, and then verse 14. Here it is. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the what? The Spirit. Which is huge, because as I'm studying Ezekiel 36 and 37 and 39, I'm beginning to realize just how important, how like Old Testament historical that promise is, and which we're going to get to, okay? But here's what you're seeing in Galatians chapter 3. You have God who made promises about, of blessings to Abraham. All nations will be what through you? Blessed. So God promised that. He goes on in Galatians 3 to say that the law came into the world 430 years after God promised Abraham. God made the promise to Abraham, and the law was not in existence yet. 430 years later, God would give the law to Moses. And what he, his point, as you read Galatians 3, is this. The law which was given later does not negate the promise that was given earlier. The promise stands, regardless of, of the law being given. And so you have this promise, the promise of blessing all nations, the promise that you're, again, we had a list somewhere around here in one of my marker boards. We, we have too many marker boards. <laughs> Not. Okay? There's a marker board somewhere around here that talks about all the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. And those blessings include things like uh, uh, the, the descendants of Abraham will possess the land of Canaan forever. They will be numerous. Many nations will come from Abraham. One great nation, the nation of Israel, will come from Abraham, and they will possess the land forever. Okay? His name will be great. He will be revered and honored throughout uh, uh, generations in human history. So you have these promises given to Abraham, and God says repeatedly to him, I will, I will, I will. And it doesn't depend on man, it depends on God and his promise. It doesn't depend on the law, which is man's merit, and whether man is faithful to live up to what God says. The law served a purpose temporarily in history. Here's the point. The law was meant to lead to Jesus. It all pointed to Jesus. And the coming of Jesus. And when Jesus came, the laws, the bicycle that now is set aside because now you run with Jesus. And what the law could not do is in, as, uh, in, in, uh, in the sense of giving the blessings of God, which it was never meant to do. Because the blessings were, were, were based in God's promise. They were not based in the merit of man in the law. The law was meant to show the sinfulness of man. Remember we saw the purpose of the Mosaic Covenant was to 
show and expose the sinful condition of man. Not to make man righteous, not to cleanse man of his righteousness, or of his, of his sin. It was meant to show and to demonstrate the utter sinfulness of man. Or as I, or Romans 7 says, uh, Romans 7 says, uh, uh, and the law was given, and when the law was given, sin sprang to life and killed me. Because when the law said, do not covet, like coveting sprang up inside of me, and coveting said, well, if the law says don't covet, I'm going to covet in every possible conceivable way. Every species or shade of coveting that is possible, I'm going to create that desire within me, within, human, within the man, right? And you read Romans 7, and it's describing that when the law is given, the reaction of sin to the righteousness of the law is to completely oppose it with, the, with sin. And Paul says in Romans 7, the law was given to show the utter sinfulness of sin. In other words, it's demonstrating in human history, in this phase of human history, how unrighteous man is, how unqualified man is for these blessings from God, and that there is a need beyond man, and there is a dependency on God to receive those blessings. So you see, the, uh, go, we are in Galatians 3, so let's just go there. Let me show you. Um, so now that I've explained that, look at verse 15. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to who? The what were spoken to Abraham? The promises, right? Here we go, look at our diagram. God promises Abraham, those, makes those promises. Scripture, uh, they were spoken to Abraham and to his what? His seed. The promise was spoken to Abraham, and the promise was spoken to his seed. Is that plural? No. Scripture does not say into seeds, meaning many people, but into your seed, meaning one person. Who is who? Jesus Christ. So when God spoke those promises to Abraham, Galatians 3 is explaining that God spoke those promises and those blessings to two people. Which two people? Abraham and his seed, who is Jesus Christ. Right? So those promises. And he verse, says in verse 17, what I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later after the promise does not set aside the covenant previously, uh, previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. In other words, when the law came, it did not negate the covenant God made with Abraham. It did not negate the promises God made with Abraham. Those promises still stand. Okay? And as we've been exploring, the question is, how can man not live up to God's standards and yet God's still unconditional? You have these, this confusion. How can, how can he give these blessings if man is so sinful and doesn't deserve them? Which is why we have the new covenant, which we're going to get to here in just a second even more. So verse 19, look what verse 19 says. Why then was the law given at all? Pause right there. Why then did God bring the law into existence after making these promises to Abraham. Why, between Abraham and Christ, was this whole, this whole structure of the Mosaic law given? Thank God Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, answers in the very next sentence. It was added because of transgressions. It was added because of transgressions until the sea to whom the promise referred had come. So there's a lot in that verse. Two things let's pull out, if I can keep them in my head and remember them. The first one is this. Notice the word until. The law was added until. Until what? Say it loud, someone. Till Christ, right? Who is the promised seed had come. When he came, the law was no longer added. It was added at, after the promise, and it terminated with the arrival of Jesus Christ. It no longer is useful. It is, as we'll see in Hebrews soon, weak, useless, obsolete, outdated, and soon passing away, at least at the time that the author of Hebrews wrote. Okay, So the law was added... And it was temporary. Do you see in that text? 
And we can go to Romans 7 and show the same thing. We're going to see it in Hebrews. We're going to see the same thing. Do you see that it's temporary? That it had a purpose for a while, but then it terminated and it no longer is in operation. It's the bicycle that's thrown aside to begin running now with Christ. Okay? The other thing to notice about the law that it says in that verse is that it was added because of transgressions, sins. In other words, there has been sin in the world since when? Since Adam sinned. God didn't create sin in the world. God did not, did not create everything in six days, and then in those six days, he just dumped in sin and made it part of the original creation. Sin has been in existence in the world since Adam's sin. The condition of man has been sinful, and man has been sinning since Adam and Eve first ate from that tree. And the corruption that led to the flood and the corruption that has led to, um, uh, that we have seen all throughout history is the result of man's sin. Now here's the thing, the law wasn't introduced until, law, until Moses, long after sin was introduced to the world. And the point that you see in scripture is that, is that like Romans 3 says this, Romans 7 says this, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, well not 2 Corinthians 3, but uh, those two other two chapters, Galatians talks about it. The law was added because of transgressions and because of sin. Why was it added because of transgression and sin? To show and to demonstrate that sin is sin and that man is sinful. It's the chapter in human history where God is saying, I'm going to demonstrate just how wicked you are. When I give you my law, you can't even live up to it. Without my law, you're not, you're not righteous at all. You're, you're wild and deserve to be drowned the flood. I give you my law. I give you my law. I know you can't live up to it, but I'm going to show that you can't live up to it. I'll give it to you. It's given through Moses. And then what happens throughout all that history, when they have possession of the law, they just become utterly apostate, rebellious, wicked, stiff necked, and corrupt. They can't even with the law, they can't live up to it. So we see that going on. So the point is here is this, the blessings that God has promised cannot come through the law. They are given through the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ. And when he comes, the law is leading to him and supposed to bring people to Christ so that when people come to Christ, the Jews and the Gentiles, those blessings that God has promised will go out to all nations. What is one of the promises that God gave in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham? And in chapter 13, and in chapter 15, and in chapter 17, and in chapter 21 of Genesis. All nations will be blessed through you. Go, therefore, and make disciples of what? All nations. You're going forth with those blessings that God has promised. Partial blessings, which we'll get to. So much we'll get to, isn't there? I'm excited. Aren't you guys excited? I'm jacked up about this, this study. Um, one more diagram real quick. So you have man, and you have Galatians 3.14. Go to Galatians 3.14 one more time. These are diagrams that I've had in the margins of my Bible, I don't know, for like two or three years now, and I've just been waiting for an appropriate time where I'm like, I can bring those babies out, you know, and this will revolutionize everyone's thinking, <laughs> you know. Galatians 3.14 says this, He redeemed us, Christ, in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So here's the point. You have man and you have the blessings that God promised. And the means by which man is going to get those blessings is not the law. Man can't go through the law to get those blessings. Everything in Galatians is saying that. Instead, it's saying, no, 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 no. In order for a man to step into and enter into the blessings that God promised, okay, he does it through, I don't know if you can read this, he does it through what? Faith in who? Jesus Christ. Now, we're talking about the works of the law, Someone might think, well, I don't follow the Mosaic law, but I try to work and be a good person. I try and work and be good at my religion. Let me ask you a question. If the most perfect religion is the one that God gave the Jews, right? If the most perfect law and set of works that God gave to man was the Mosaic covenant, tell me there's some sort of superior 
code of moral righteousness anywhere else other than that what God gave in the Mosaic Covenant. There's not. Why would somebody say, I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to follow my own set of rules. I'm, whatever I think is right, I'm going to follow that. And somehow God will be impressed with my, own right, with my own rules or my own religion. I'm devoted to my religion. Our devotion, our work, our merit does not get the blessings. Only when we say, I don't have any merit, I therefore put my faith in Jesus Christ, then I take possession of those promised blessings through faith not through works, okay? So really important to understand that. Now, if you have any questions on that, I'm going 100 miles an hour. You, my dear brother or sister, are going to have to hold on because there's never enough time. Go to Hebrews, please. Hebrews. Why is there a need for a new covenant? If I, I've been hinting at it up until now, but now let's really pull out these. Specific. I want you to see these verses where the book of Hebrews is the book of the superiority of Christ over everything that the Jews knew and understood. Everything. Angels, Moses, the temple, the priesthood, the law, right? The festivals, everything. He's, he's, he's superior to all of it, okay? So go to Hebrews 7, 19. I think we started there last week, but we'll, we'll go there now. We are looking at, keep this in mind, why the New Covenant is superior to the Mosaic Covenant. That's what the author of Hebrews is talking about. The author of Hebrews is explaining to us why we need the New Covenant and what it does for us that the Mosaic could never do. Number one, Hebrews 7 says that the Mosaic Covenant could never perfect anyone, but the New Covenant does. Okay, so Hebrews 7, okay. Look at verse 19, verse 18 and 19. The former regulation, that is the Mosaic Covenant, is set aside because it was weak and useless. Why was it weak and useless? Verse 19, for the law made nothing, what? Perfect. Look at verse 11. Go back a couple verses to verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed, the law given to the people established that priesthood. Why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron. In other words, you have the, or, the, the new covenant and you have the old covenant. And the Mosaic covenant could not, he's, he's asking this question. If you could attain perfection through the old covenant, why was a new covenant ever even planned? The point of a new covenant was to do what the old could never do. Bring perfection to the worshiper. Bring perfection. And by perfection, we're going to see cleanse from sin. Okay, so perfect. There's, there's a ton more verses on all this stuff. But let's look at the second thing. The old covenant cannot cleanse you of your sin. Could not cleanse any Jew of their sin. Go to Hebrews 9. Let's look at verses 26 and 28. So Hebrews 9, verses 26 and 28. Otherwise... Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 28, so Christ was sacrificed, how many times? Once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Why did he come the first time according to that last verse? To what sin? To take away sin, to bear sin. To bear sin meaning he will bear the burden of our sin, the guilt of it, the condemnation of it, and the punishment of it. He's the one who, who we're all here in a group and we all look at him and God puts on him all of our guilt and condemnation and he goes off and alone carries all of that and suffers all of it for us. He came to bear sin the first time, but when he comes again, it's not to bear sin when he comes the second time. It's to bring salvation, to bring deliverance, right? Um, and now, we could go on. There, I mean, so many, but I want to get through all these. So, we're in Hebrews 9. Here's the other thing. The Mosaic Covenant could not give you access to God. You could not approach God. The New Covenant gives you access to God. And in the new covenant, you can approach God. 
So look at uh, Hebrews 9 and look at verse 8 with me. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. The way into what place? The most holy place, which is the heart of the Jewish tabernacle and temple. No one was allowed to go in there. Remember we talked about this? Only the high priest, and he could only go once a year, and he can only go in through blood, which is what he's explaining in this chapter. Nobody was allowed to approach God. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You can approach God. Hebrews 4. Let us then approach God boldly with confidence, he says. Okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, Hebrews 10. Go to Hebrews 10 one second. See the contrast here. Hebrews 10, verse 19, begins a summarization of chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. Verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, Hebrews 10, 19, since we have confidence, watch, to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. You see that? He just got done explaining for a chapter and a half that the high priest could only go in through the blood of an animal. He had to make sacrifice, blood sacrifices for himself. He had to make blood sacrifices for the people. And once he had done all of this detailed ritual of sacri blood sacrifices, then he could work up the courage to part that curtain and step in. Because if he stepped in and nothing had been done right, what would happen to him? Dead. Because nobody approaches God. Nobody approaches God. But now, through the new covenant established in whose blood? Christ's blood, we have access into the most holy place, into the presence of God. We are welcomed into the presence of God. The Mosaic Covenant couldn't do that. The new covenant does. The conscience is cleansed. The Mosaic Covenant never cleansed the conscience. Now we're moving into the inward part of the worshiper. This is what is meant by be, not being able to perfect. Perfection refers to the complete cleansing of the worshiper. Only ceremonially and outwardly were the worshippers cleansed through the animal sacrifices. Through the blood of Jesus and faith in Jesus, the whole worshiper is cleansed. Body, soul, spirit, their conscience, their heart, it is all cleansed through Jesus Christ and his blood. That's what is meant by perfection. The fullness of cleansing is given, not this outward partial cleansing only. Okay, so let's look at what I mean by this. Um, so I'll explain it, and then we'll read it here. So Hebrews 9, we're still in Hebrews 9. No, where we were in Hebrews 10, go back to 9. This is an illustration, verse 9, for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered under the Mosaic Covenant were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various, various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the what? The new order, okay? The new covenant, right? His, uh, the approach of that. Look at verse 15. Verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. That's going back to Abraham. The promise given to Abraham that would go out and bless all nations through Christ. Now that he, Christ, has died as a ransom to what? Set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Okay? So set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. And then uh, the conscience, look at verse uh, chapter 10. Okay? Let's read verses 1 through 4. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it, the law, can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, they could never make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? 
for the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. The Mosaic law was unable to remove the guilty conscience of the worshiper. Look at verse 3. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. The sacrifices were not meant to take away the guilty conscience. It was meant to stimulate guilt in the conscience. To remind the worshiper that you have sinned. It's being taken away. It's, It's being covered over through the blood of animals. But you're not cleansed except by the blood of Jesus Christ. Covered and cleansed are two different things. To cover over something... And God temporarily in history puts up with it, Romans 3, until finally he actually, in the historical experience of Jesus dying on the cross, takes away sin. That's the basis of the taking away of sin and the cleansing of sin. But it was covered over through animal sacrifices during the Mosaic Covenant. And he's saying here, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins and by extension to remove or wash a guilty conscience. Listen, blood, the blood of animals, the blood of animals and goats can never wash a guilty conscience and neither can the sweat of a religious person. The religious sweat of a morally devoted and religious person. Try all you want to be as devoted as you want. Listen, there is no greater uh, slave driver than a guilty conscience. You will never work off a guilty conscience. A guilty conscience has one solution and that is to be washed and cleansed once for all by the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, take away sins. Can t- never take away sins. Uh, so the old covenant can't take away sins, but the new covenant can. Now we covered that a little bit from cleansing from sin. And those scriptures talk about that. We're talking about the fact that the old covenant could not touch the internal part of the worshiper. It was just external, as we read in Roman or Hebrews 9. In 2 Corinthians 3, and we're going to read there because we read 2 Corinthians 3 last week, but these are four things I want us to see from 2 Corinthians 3 that we get through the new covenant that the old Mosaic covenant could never give us. Number one, could never give us life. Could never give eternal life. The Mosaic covenant did not bring life. What did it bring instead? Death. The old covenant could not bring life righteousness to the worshiper the old covenant could only bring condemnation for the unrighteousness of the worshiper the old covenant was temporary but the new covenant is eternal the holy spirit was not given to people under the mosaic covenant understand this In the age we live in, since Christ, under the new covenant, the indwelling, the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, since we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, is something that is exclusive to the church of Jesus Christ since the day of Pentecost. It was not the experience of the Jewish people in the Mosaic covenant throughout the Old Testament period, or anyone before that. The Holy Spirit did not indwell David, except at times, Every time there's the indwelling or the oncoming, if you will, of the Holy Spirit, it was temporary for a specific task, but it was not a permanent residence inside. There was no holy temple that a person's body was. That is exclusively a a New Testament thing. And that is born of the new covenant. Go to Ezekiel with me. Go to Ezekiel 36 with me. This is what I'm talking about. We'll read these two verses, and then we'll wrap up for the day, and then uh, we'll move into church next. But I want you to see... That the blessing, the gift of the Holy Spirit has been God's intention uh, for worshipers of him through the new covenant since the days of the Old Testament. That is what he is going to do. He is going to, through the new covenant, give the Holy Spirit to people. So look at Ezekiel 36. Now remember, let me ask you a question. Do you remember from last week? Who, was, who were the original recipients or intended recipients, the original audience uh, who was promised the new covenant? The Israelites, the nation of Israel. And that nation is the focus of God here in Ezekiel 36. So in Ezekiel 36, look at verses 26 and 27 with me. Okay. 
Actually, let's read 24 through 20, 27. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and I will bring you back into your own land. Boy, that sounds like an Abrahamic covenant, doesn't it? I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Can I ask you a question? What's this? Cleanse from sin. Old covenant couldn't do that. Right now he's talking about the new covenant that he's going to do with them. Okay? That I will cleanse, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. That's Jeremiah 31, what we read last week. Okay? I will remove from you your heart, your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you to move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. In Ezekiel, when they were in exile in Babylon, God was speaking through Ezekiel the same and expanded details of the promises of the new covenant. I'm going to put my spirit in you. I'm going to give you a new heart. I will move you to follow my laws and my decrees. You won't walk in disobedience anymore when I establish this covenant with you and I bring it to fulfillment. Go to um, Ezekiel 39. Last verse and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Ezekiel 39, verse 27 through 29. When I have brought them, the Israelites, back from the nations and have gathered them from the countries of their enemies, I will be proved holy through them in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. For th now, who's he speaking about? Who's going to know? Israel. Remember the, what Jeremiah said about the new covenant? They will all know me from the least to the greatest, right? Here he's talking about that. He's expanding details of what he means by that. They will all know that I am the Lord their God, for though I sent them into exile among the nations, I will gather them to their own land, not leaving any behind. Here you go. I will no longer hide my face from them. He's hiding it from them right now. For I will pour out my spirit on the people of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord. I will pour out my spirit. One of the, funda one of the most uh, essential aspects of the new covenant is that the worshiper is regenerated. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is given to the person who believes on Jesus Christ. And that new covenant element that God was talking about to the nation of Israel, those blessings are now being offered to which nations? All nations, right? All nations. Promises of Abraham, Galatians 3 talks about there's righteousness that was wrapped up in those blessings. The Holy Spirit and the reception of the Holy Spirit was wrapped up in those blessings. Abraham didn't know all those details. It was unpacked more through the scriptures as the scriptures were added to through the prophets. But those blessings included righteousness, the inheritance of the world, the, uh, the Holy Spirit's indwelling, uh, the declaration of a man being just through faith in Jesus Christ. It was all promised to Abraham, didn't come through the law. It comes through Jesus Christ and goes out into all the blessing of, uh, uh, to all the nations. All of that, all of that. So you're seeing these covenants kind of come together. Let me ask you a question. If the, if the requirement to live in the land for the Israelites is that they must be righteous, they must be spiritually correct, and they must be obeying the commands of God. When the new covenant is in effect for them, and it transforms them, where they are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and they, begin, and they will follow, God will move them, himself move them to follow his commands, where are they going to live? Their land. Millennial kingdom, baby. Millennial kingdom. When they are spirit, when in Ezekiel 37 talks about when they are resurrected, God will put his spirit in them when, the, when he resurrects the nation of Israel, when he regathers them from all the nations. So when the resurrection of Israel happens and the regathering of alive Israelites uh, around the nations and they're regathered in, one thing is going to happen for both those groups of Israelites. They're going to receive the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel 37 says. And when they receive the Holy Spirit, they will be moved to follow all God's commands. And why is it important for them to follow God's commands? Because he's bringing them back into the land. And you don't violate my land with all your immorality. You must be righteous living in my land. Okay? And when that happens, Ray, you might have to do Romans 11 next week. Oh, I want to get to Romans 11. You can't. I'm going to do it. I really want to do that. <laughs> I want to do Romans 11 uh, in two weeks. I'm not going to be here next week. We're going to be out of town on vacation this week in Indiana. But when I, Ray's got some Israel stuff coming next week, super exciting. So let's make sure we get that recorded. But when I get back the week after, we'll get into Romans 11. 
Who wants to skip church and just keep going? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay, uh, let me pray real quick, and then we got everybody's like, let's get church. We're, we're sitting back here. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the new covenant and all of these blessings that are come to us through Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. And God, we know that it is not by works of the law or works of religion or works of morality that we could step into those promised blessings, but only by stepping to Jesus Christ in faith and receiving him as our savior today. That's how we receive all of it, God. And it is that humble approach to your son, God, that each one of us have taken. And if there's some here today who have not yet humbly approached him, may today be that day. And God, I pray that we would be a, a, a growing congregation, that we are maturing from milk to meat, as the scriptures say, understanding the deep things in your word, that God, in understanding them, we might be filled with the joy of the hope of all of your promises, looking forward and anticipating all that is to come, God, as we devote ourselves not only to knowing your word, but God, to living it as well. Thank you for these believers who are here with me this morning. What a joy it is to teach when people are here along with me learning. Lord, they want to learn as well. And I thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen.